great. Okay, so, yep. Um, I'm Amy McKenzie. All right, so very brief compressed background. Um, I really like making robots. I used to do this quite a lot. Uh, this is one I helped design back in 2004. Uh, did a lot of the sort of design and construction work. And so this was all done with just sort of traditional computer design program, right? You're drawing circles and extruding things to make parts, and then you're clicking and dragging and putting parts together to make an assembly to sort of put together this whole robot. Um, and that was cool, but I kind of wanted to design things with code. I got to a point where, you know, like a lot of this logic is repetitive, right? And it's sort of, I wanted to be able to sort of encode design logic in a way that I could reuse it and automate things. And eventually sort of came to the decision, I really wanted to sort of just write code that designed robots instead of moving our mouse around to do the same thing. So a lot's involved in that, but one thing you need is a really nice geometry library, right? It's a really nice way to work with geometry in code. So, um, start, oops. Well, how this started back when I was young and no facial hair, um, started out with C++. I thought, okay, I wanted like maximum performance, right? Let's make a C++ geometry library and build everything on top of that. Um, so this is basically what the code looked like. You had a sort of a 3D point class there. You can construct it from XYZ coordinates. This is great, built up lots of functionality. It was fast could do lots of cool things with it, but it sort of got to the point where C++ is great if you're, just, you're focused on performance, right? You want to sort of really finely control how the bits are flowing around your program and carefully manage memory and these sorts of things. Um, but I wasn't really looking forward to using it to sort of use domain logic. You know, if I wanted to write code that says, okay, you know, lay out 13 rows of desks here and each row should have seven equally spaced chairs of this particular shape and you know, lay out a lecture hall perhaps. Um, wasn't really looking forward to doing that in C++. So I started looking around for sort of other languages where that could be a little more um, declarative or sort of flexible and expressive, um, although expressive is a loaded term as we discussed recently, um, and sort of ended up in Scala. So took this package, basically rebuilt it in Scala. Um, so now the point 3D class looked like this, not too different. Pretty similar things to C++, just didn't have to worry about memory management. You can generally be a lot more expressive. Scala lets you do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and I thought this was, this was pretty neat. I guess I was pretty, pretty a fan of this. Um, but then sort of realized, and there wasn't a great sort of visualization UI uh, story here. Like JavaFX, it's, you know, it's okay. It wasn't really, it wasn't really my thing. Um, and it really seemed like all these sort of really cool um, development and sort of visualization was happening, at least in the desktop, uh, was happening on the web. Started looking at web languages, played around with Dart, it was okay, kind of liked it, um, didn't really excite me. Um, ended up in Elm, obviously, uh, and the rest is history. So what we now have is, as Tiva mentioned, Elm Geometry. Um, this is a package I published. It's for just working with 2D and 3D geometry in a pretty generic way. Um, it's pretty big. It's got data types for points, vectors, axes, planes, triangles, curves. Um, do lots of cool sort of interesting geometric manipulations with it. Uh, and it's meant to be building blocks for things like you know, 2D drawings, 3D renderings like this one. Um, by the way, this and every other image you'll see in this presentation, other than from photos, um, were all done 100% in Elm. So these are all generated in Elm, rendered in Elm. Um, but I'm not just interested in, in visualization. I'm also interested in things like generating 3D models so that you can manufacture them or simulate them or machine them in sort of different ways. So graphics is just one aspect. But after that, what I really want to talk today is about sort of the transition um, going from C++ and Scala to Elm and sort of what that involved and, and what I learned. So switching to Elm, obviously you're sort of, there are some aspects of object-oriented language that you don't have in Elm, so there's no mutability, not really a problem because I wasn't really using it anyways, uh, but you don't have overloading, right? You can't have one function that works on multiple different types of arguments. You don't have inheritance, so you can't like inherit functionality uh, between different classes. Um, so as a result, I had to sort of unlearn some of these object-oriented patterns and learn some new ones. And this talk is attempting to sort of distill down to sort of really two main lesson lessons that I learned um, during this process. So the first one, think different. And I don't mean um, that you should be creative and think outside the box, um, although you should do those things. Uh, what I really mean is that Sometimes when in an object-oriented languages, we very naturally think that we want to group things into hierarchies, right? We want to make things the same. We want to all subclass from one thing. We want to group things together. 
Um, and often in Elm, it's, it's better to split things apart um, and treat them as, as two different things, and that works out well. So, as an example, uh, vectors and unit vectors. Uh, so it's a pretty common thing in a geometry package. Um, a unit vector is just a vector that happens to have a length of one, and it's useful in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different situations. So in C++, I had a unit vector class, and it was implicitly convertible to a vector. So anywhere you had one, you could sort of pass the other. Uh, in Scala, unit vector just inherited from vector. So similarly, if you if you were expecting a vector, you could pass a unit vector, and everything just worked. Uh, but neither of these techniques, we can't, we can't use them in Elm, right? So what do we do about uh, a function that operates on two vectors that maybe should also operate on, on unit vectors? You know, we have to sort of write this in a different way. Um, so the first step in Elm uh, is just turn these into two different types, right? And sort of when I started looking at this, I started thinking, like, well, okay, just in this situation, what is a unit vector anyways? I mean, a vector has a length and direction. A unit vector has a length of one, so the length isn't meaningful. So basically, it's just a direction, right? And then I thought, well, what if we just call it a direction and think of it as sort of an entirely different concept? Uh, so in Elm, that is, that is in fact what we have. There are separate, there's a vector type and there's a direction type. And they just look like this. So, you know, same internal representation, but two totally separate types um, that you can't sort of mix and match. So, brief interlude. Um, one of the things you can do with two vectors is take the dot product of them, right? This is going back to high school, perhaps. Uh, if you have two vectors, length A, length B, some angle theta between them, the dot product ends up being A times B times the cosine of theta. Useful for things like checking if two vectors are perpendicular. Um, so you can do this on two vectors, but you can also kind of do it on two, two directions. Right, so now if we have a vector dot dot product function, it doesn't work on directions anymore because it's now a totally different type. So what do we do? Um, so the first step is thinking about, well, what does, what does it mean if we have, like, say, that, say a dot product, uh, a mixed dot product, a dot product with a vector and a direction. Pretty much always what that means is that you're, you're finding the component of a vector in some direction. Right, um, and that comes up in cases like you want to, I want to measure the distance of a point from a plane in 3D. So in 3D I have a plane which is like this sort of infinite flat surface, and I want to measure how far a point is from that infinitely flat surface. I can take a point on the plane, I can sort of form a vector from that point to the point I'm interested in, and then I can find the sort of the component of that vector in the normal direction of the plane, and that gives me the, uh, the distance of the point from the plane, and then I can do whatever I want with that. You know, check if it's above, check if it's below, um, check if it's within some tolerance, etc. So it, it seemed to me that every time I was doing a dot product of vector with direction, I was really saying, what's the component of a vector in a particular direction? You know, what's the component of a velocity in the up direction? Whatever. So the obvious solution here was let's just have two functions with two different names that kind of have two different real semantic meanings. So we still have vector dot dot product, which takes two vectors and produces a float, and that's useful for some cases, especially sort of low level, low level code. Uh, and then, for example, you have vector dot component in, uh, which takes a direction instead of a vector, and it's basically mathematically it's doing exactly the same thing, but conceptually it's doing something rather different. And I really liked how this worked out. I found the code was more readable, it made more sense. Um, sort of, it just sort of read exactly like what I was actually trying to do. Um, and I thought, just in general, just this, this separation into sort of, okay, we have a vector type, we have a direction type, they're different, they do different things, you can do different things with them, led to nice APIs. So you can, you can take the length of a vector, but not of a direction, because that doesn't really make sense, it's always going to be one. Um, you can get the direction of a vector, um, which returns a maybe, because the zero vector has no direction. You can translate a point by a vector, or you can translate a point in a particular direction by a particular distance. So this all has sort of worked out nicely. Uh, and in fact, uh, at this point, when I started experimenting with Elm, I mean, now I do pretty much all of my coding, at least in the, uh, you know, side projects in Elm. At this point, I was sort of doing part M, part Scala, and around this time in the history of Elm geometry, you start seeing commits show up in the Scala code uh, that look like this. 
um, make directions less vectory, more distinct, where I was taking some of the changes that I made in my Elm code that I had to make to make things work in Elm, um, realized that, oh wow, I really like this design better. It's sort of just more clean, it's simple, uh, makes a lot of sense. And so I went back and sort of just ported those changes back to Scala, even though I didn't have to. I just liked that design better. Um, so just, why does this work? Like, why don't we do this everywhere in every language, right? Um, so in one thing, in Elm, creating a new type is incredibly easy, right? It's like, you know, type A equals B, done. Um, you don't have to make a new file. Uh, there's not a lot of boilerplate. There's not a lot of syntax. It's just really easy to just add a new type and start working with it. Uh, the rigorous type system and the super helpful compiler really help working with this. You know, if, if I pass a vector or I meant to pass a direction or vice versa, the compiler will immediately tell me um, in a really sort of friendly way. Uh, so it's kind of okay to have different types because the compiler will help you keep track of them. Um, if you really do need to treat two things as the same, it's always possible to wrap them in a union type, right? So you always have that sort of, that way to combine types if necessary. So it's fine to leave them as separate initially and then combine them later if you really need to. But I found often you don't. Uh, and in general, you know, having more clarity about what each individual type does um, sort of compensates for the fact that maybe now you have more types to keep track of. Um, so I think these are sort of some of the reasons that are sort of specific to Elm or functional languages that make these approaches work really well, um, whereas maybe they wouldn't always work with a sort of transplanted back into an object-oriented language. So takeaways from lesson number one, um, don't make one thing perform two different roles, right? If that happens, maybe it just try thinking about what, was it, what, if, what if this was just two separate things? Um, and if two things are similar, like you know, vectors, unit vectors are very similar, sort of resist the urge to try to make one thing that combines them, right? I want to have one concept that both of these things are instances of that concept. Just let them be different things, right? And it, it's, it's usually just kind of fine. Um, you know, this discussion comes up in the Elm community sometimes. You no, know, I think, I, I personally think this applies to both sort of data types and APIs. I think it's fine that we don't have one pure function. We have functions with different names that make sense for different data types. Um, and it just sort of, I think, kind of, just kind of works out. OK, so second lesson. Um, this is kind of a rehash of one you've probably, you may have seen already, but I think in terms of can versus is. So if you have a polygon, you know, a polygon is a collection of, you know, vertices. So we've got a bunch of outer vertices and some inner vertices. And one thing you can do with a polygon is triangulate it. So going back and looking at some of the old object-oriented code, this is, again, like just real code, those old git commits. Um, in C++, a 2D line segment, this is the start of the definition of a class. It's like, OK, line segment, it's transformable, it's convertible, um, it's largely defined by the things it can do. Right? And this is, this is common in object-oriented languages. We inherit from interfaces. We implement certain interfaces. We have member functions. And, and data is just sort of like private. It's like an implementation detail. We don't care about it. Uh, Scala, very similar. A line segment, it's scalable, which is a trait that inherits from transformable. It's bounded, because I can put a bounding box around it. It's geometrically comparable, because I can sort of compare two line segments within a tolerance. Um, it has all the various curve operations. In Elm, a line segment is two endpoints, and that's, that's basically it. We've now defined a line segment, and we can, just, we can go home, right? Um, that is fundamentally what a line segment is. It is two points that are you know, connected by a line. Separately from that, there are lots of things we can do with a line segment, right? So if we want to get the vector sort of from one end of the line segment to another, great. We can you know, subtract. We can, we can do that. But what a line segment is, is sort of very separate and independent from what you can do with a line segment. So as sort of one interesting example of this, um, transformations. So this is an extremely important part of you know, Elm geometry or any geometry library. You want to be able to transform and sort of move around geometry. So you can you know, rotate these circles around that center point. You can, uh, translate, I didn't show that one because it's kind of boring. Um, you can mirror these shapes across axes. You can scale things about a certain center point. You can convert stuff between coordinate systems if you have things to find over here and you want them sort of relative to over here. 
Um, so in Scala, we had sort of this object that kind of defined a transformation, and this was actually a trait, and you know, transformations could apply themselves to different types of geometry objects. Um, geometry objects themselves inherited from transformable, and then as long as you implemented this sort of abstract transform by function, then you've got all these other functions for like translation and rotation, and great. Um, and this didn't really work, work, work in Elm that well, uh, because we, you know, we can't inherit from interfaces and share functionality that way. So I had to sort of completely rethink this structure. Um, and again, sort of thinking about, well, what is a transformation anyway, right? A transformation is something that, like, maybe it takes an input point and it rotates it to give you an output point. So it, it takes an input and it sort of produces an output. And if I have two transformations, I can sort of chain them together and, like, you know, compose them, and that makes one big transformation that does something more complex. Uh, and it don't think... You know, that, that's, that, what that starts sounding is, is a lot like, like a function, right? A function takes inputs, produces outputs, you can chain them together. Uh, so I thought, well, what if, what if transformations were, were just functions? And I don't remember exactly what I looked like um, when I had this thought, but I think it was something like that. Uh, so this is, this is what Elm geometry, some of the internals look like today. We've got our module, our line segment module. Um, We've got a line segment type, same as before, that I showed before. Uh, and then we've just got a translate, like a translation function. So translate by takes a vector and a line segment and just applies that translation to the line segment. And that, that's, that's all it is. Uh, it's just a function. Um, and this works out, I think, really well. So, you know, because of LM functions work, we can partially apply them, and we can sort of map translation over a list of line segments to translate all of them all at once. Um, we can put them in pipelines, so we can start with them and put triangle. We can rotate it around the z-axis by 45 degrees, take that triangle and translate it in the y direction by five units, and then take that triangle and project it down onto the xy plane. And so now we've just sort of nicely done this whole sort of sequence of transformations all at once. Um, by the way, if anybody's sort of an expert in geometry and saying, oh, this is inefficient because there's, there's no way to sort of, you know, turn these all into just like one matrix, um, there is a nice solution for that sort of outside the scope of this talk, but happy to talk about it afterwards. And it doesn't fundamentally change um, what you do. So a couple takeaways. Um, if you've been in the Elm geometry uh, for a while, um, you'll often see this, this advice, like don't keep functions in your model and don't put them in your messages. Um, if you haven't been in the Ellen in community for a while, I mean, congratulations, this is a very exciting time for you. I'm kind of jealous. Um, but again, this sort of separation between your model should be like, what is the state of your, of your application? Your messages should be, what just happened? Uh, and then functions are like, what can I do with my model to transform it and, and just into response to some message? Just keeping those separate is, is really important. Um, generally keep functions and data strictly separated. Anytime I have you know, a record which has a function as a field, that's sometimes useful, but often kind of weird. Uh, and again, I've sort of touched on this a couple times, but try to think about you know, what is this thing? Like, what is this data fundamentally? And then completely separately from that, what can I do with it? How can I transform it? What operations are possible on it? OK, I think that's all I had. Um, any questions, always happy to chat. Um, GitHub, Slack, Twitter. I'm Ian McKenzie almost everywhere except Twitter. Um, extra E in there. Um, yeah, I'm on Slack in the Geometry channel or direct message. And uh, great. Thank you. Cool, yeah. yeah. Yep, happy to have questions. Yep. So we have some time for questions, so... <laughs> Ian, do you have uh, functions in your library for rendering shapes into SVG? Uh, so in Elm, Geom Elm Geometry itself is just pure geometry. Um, so you can, you can transform geometry, you can transform a triangle to another triangle. Uh, it has no actual rendering functions. There is Elm Geometry SVG, which is a separate package that builds on top of it, um, which does you know, render things as SVG. 
Um, and then I'm working on some other packages for sort of higher level 2D drawing uh, and 3D rendering, um, which is what I use to generate some of the images in here. So like, yes, it's possible, but the core library doesn't include it because it is, it is just the, the geometric transformations. Anybody else? Cool. Uh, I have a question for you. <laughs> did, did you do something with Andre with WebGL or? Uh... Uh, so I mean, certainly uh, Andre and I talk quite a lot. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm always in the WebGL channel. So if you message and I'll see it. Um, and yeah, we've collaborated on various WebGL related projects. And uh, yeah, and there will be there will be more of those in the future, I'm sure. So. Nice. Uh, any any any? Oh yeah. Hi. Um, so you you said you started off with uh, C plus plus because you were focused on performance. Um, is so was uh, was Elm able to give you performance you wanted? Did you realize you did, it didn't matter as much as you originally thought, or what was the story there? Uh, I mean, certainly it can. Uh, Elm can give you very good performance, and I mean, I have not yet run into any blockers. Um, there have been you know, there are a couple of times that there are some sort of numerically intensive computations in Elm geometry. One of them is for taking some curve and turning it, uh, give, computing an arc length parameterization. So if you have some curve and you want to move out long at a sort of a constant speed for animation, um, you need to sort of do a bunch of computations which are fairly expensive. Um, so my initial implementation of that was, you know, a bit slow. Uh, but it was pretty easy to optimize. Um, and um, if you're interested in sort of how to write numerical code in Elm such that it's fast, uh, there are some, lots of great tips, um, usually the center around you know, reducing the number of objects that you allocate. Um, and so, so far, I have been able to sort of get the performance that, that I needed. And at least for rendering, um, it's not typically, you know, most of the work there, if you do it right, is just on the GPU anyways. Um, so every indication so far is that we will be able to, be able to get enough performance. Um, and you know, if you need to just do something really crazy, you can always just make a make a request to a server that does the number crunching and then gives you results back. But I really wanted to be able to share most of the interesting logic in Elm and, and you know defer any sort of little bits of really complex computation off to a server or like you know Rust compiled to Wasm or or something. So yeah. We'll take one last question. Anybody? You mentioned Wasm. Have you actually done that? Sorry? You mentioned Wasm. Have you actually done that? Uh, no, I have not tried compiled anything to WebAssembly yet. It's sort of, you know, it's still young. I haven't actually had a need for it yet. Um, but it's sort of in the back of my mind that, you know, if three years in the future I sort of hit a point where, oh, there's something I can't do in Elm, because I need sort of really low-level performance guarantees, at that point, it should be possible to you know, write it in Rust and put it inside WebAssembly and, and, and solve the problem that way. Are all your robots in uh, the virtual world, or do you actually make any of them out of physical stuff? Oh, no, no. That, that, robot, that robot was very much built. Um, <laughs> uh, so for many years, I, was, I competed in the first robotics competition, um, US first, or firstinspires.org. Um, so it's like it's not like battle bots. You don't fight. You play a sport where you're trying to score points. So more like you know American football. Um, uh, so yes, uh, very much, very physical, and uh, made some really cool robots. And I'm happy to talk about those. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. Mm -hmm.